You're very welcome. Follow me. Too early. What time is it? It's only 20 minutes to seven yet. On you come. No, sir, I'll give you a hand with that bag. Make sure you stay warm. Is it, it's as cold here as in, in New York. Well done. Well, I can't mean a fault to each and every one of you. You're all very welcome. So we're going to go directly to Glassdale and Cemetery now, guys. It'll be getting bright soon. So it's going to be spooky in Glassdale and Cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll be telling you all the history. We'll be going through the history bit by bit, blow by blow. And we'll have a very checkered history. Is Ireland still under the rule of the Queen? What? Is Ireland still under the rule of the Queen? No. No. What about Northern Ireland? Northern Ireland is like a different jurisdiction. So we're just coming up to Glastonbury Cemetery. It was opened in 1832. There's 1.2 million people buried there. The population of Dublin is 1.3 million. So there's almost as many people buried in Glastonbury as the population of the city in Dublin. First of all, you're all very welcome to Glasnevin Cemetery. My name is Shane Moctomoss. I'm the resident historian up here, and I'll bring you on the tour this morning. Uh, just a little bit of history about the cemetery before we get going. The cemetery opened in 1832, because prior to that, Catholics of Ireland didn't have their own burial ground, particularly in Dublin. And a guy called Daniel O'Connell, you heard of him? Yes. Right, okay, so no spoofing on this tour at all, no making things up. Uh, um, he came along and started to fight for the rights of Catholics, and one of these rights was purchase ground and open cemeteries. There's one and a half million people buried here, and the cemetery is 124 acres in size. Now, this morning, we're going to visit all one and a half million. No. But that's the problem. The place is so vast that you could tell the whole history of Ireland ten times over. And so I've just picked out half a dozen of the more interesting or famous people's graves, and I'll show you those. And if you want to buy a grave off me later, cash is king, cash is king. I'll, settle. I'll do a group rate. Um, right, <laughs> come on, I'll show you some graves. I knew about Glass Nevin from coming here as a kid with Dad, so I knew where I was going. But the day of the interview, I remember wandering around, and I, and I was just looking at all the graves, and it was Countess Markovich, and it was the O'Rahilly, and it was the Donovan Rossa, name after name after name, all iconic names from Irish history. I realised this place is incredibly special. I just so wanted to work here. I, I just, I, I, I would have given anything for the job. This space holds all of Ireland's history. People come in and say, where's your museum? And they look at this building. I don't say, no, you can look out there. Look out onto that site. There's the museum. It's a museum of Irish history, art, sculpture, poetry, and it's the history and love of Ireland for the last, we're here 190 years, so we'll go back three, four generations prior to that. That's the site on that site, that's the museum. So as a young man, I would have been in when family members would have been buried in the cemetery. No matter who you talk to in Dublin, has somebody buried in, in, in Las Neman due to the fact that it's 150 acres and a million and a half people in it. So most people will have a relation in the cemetery. There is a grave in Glasnevin which I particularly like because you have many graves in Irish graveyards where you have a kneel and pray. And there's one in Glasnevin where uh, you read, sit and chat. And I absolutely love that because this is exactly what should happen. The fact that Glasnevin gets, you know, over 200,000 visitors a year, that definitely says something about Irish people and their relationship with the dead. The idea that Irish people are interested in their ancestors, that visiting a place of memory and mourning is important to Irish people, that's a very distinctive feature of Irish culture.
Okay, so the first stop is the final resting place of Daniel O'Connell, who set up the cemetery. He was a remarkable individual. Why the bagpipes? <laughs> I thought that was inside my head. Can you hear them as well? Right, yeah. okay, so after he died, they took Daniel O'Connell down here, and that's his coffin that you can see in through the portholes there at the side. Right? It's good luck to touch it. Oh, no, sorry, it's terrible bad luck to touch it. Sorry, I put, I, oh, I make, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Mom, we go see another dead person. When they set up the cemetery, they did two things that were really clever. They used Loudon's system of measuring out graves. Loudon was this French guy that had designed how you would get the maximum amount of burial from any one piece of land. This is a very early map of the cemetery. Each small little box represents a grave. It's two and a half feet by eight. They're given a grid reference in the terms of letters. So JF72 will be a family grave belonged to somebody and we'll be able to look up the records and say exactly who's buried in there. Different graves cost different amounts of money. So the nearer you are to the entrance or somebody famous like O'Connell or De Valera or Collins, you pay more money for that plot. If you're down the back of the cemetery, the plots get much cheaper. Even on Ben's, he's maximised the amount of plots that he can get into the graveyard because plots equal revenue and revenue equals business. The other thing that they embraced was the Victorian love of record keeping. The first person buried in the cemetery was Michael Carey. He was an 11 year old boy. He was from Francis Street in Dublin and he was buried here on the 22nd of February 1832. From 1860s onwards, you start getting into great detail about the person they're burying. They start to record the occupation of the person, uh, their cause of death, where they lived, uh, their status, their religion. So a huge piece of social information. So if I run my finger down here and tell you what they were dying of 100 years ago, I have paralysis, I have childbirth, I have a fatty heart, tuberculosis, epilepsy, simple things like diarrhea, teething, decline, rupture and paralysis. So. At any given time, you can see what the people of Dublin were dying of. This circle here is the cholera pit of 1849. In 1849, cholera whipped around the world. When it hit Dublin, 13,000 people died of it, and they're all buried here. And this was like a, a mass pit. They brought the bodies up late at night, placed them in the pit, and placed quicklime on top of them. But certainly for the first 10, 20 years, the cemetery struggled to get people out here. And the majority of people being buried out here were people dying of cholera diseases or poor ground. And, you know, it, it wasn't until later that we got the, the wealthy people and the middle classes to come out. All of this ground around here, all of the grass that you can see, this is the pauper's grave. One of the reasons the cemetery tried to get as many famous people as possible to come out and be buried was to give it a sense of popularity. Glasnevin rose up as, as to be the place to be buried, you know, it was more important with each iconic figure being buried here than the next person coming along in the political process or the revolutionary process uh, wanted to be buried in Glasnevin. Parnell, he was a bit like Elvis or Jim Morrison. After he died, people were saying, ah, oh, he's not dead, he's, he's just hiding, he's coming back. He was seen working as a waiter in Reno or somewhere, but... but um, <laughs> So for years, people thought, ah, oh, Parnell's going to turn up any day. Now he was long gone. So Parnell was buried here, and his mother is buried as well. Catherine O'Shea. Ah, uh, who else we do here? Behind me is the grave of James Larkin, the trade union leader. Maud Gone McBride, he was a woman revolutionary. W.B. Yeats fell madly in love with her and wrote some really nice poems about his broken heart. Uh, some of the names would be more recognisable than others. This plot over here, Countess Markovich, you hear of her? O'Donovan Rossa, the O'Rahilly, uh, Cahill Brewer, and these are all people who fought for our Irish independence during the War of Independence. But there's also people buried in here that died in the Civil War. Well, come on inside and, and, and I'll show you the museum and you just can warm up. You look like you're going to die some reason. <laughs> like all of these things you see an ad in the paper one Sunday was manager designated for Glasnevin Cemetery. I knew the cemetery because I had worked in the Botanic Gardens next door. And um, we used to look through the railings and say, what's that place in there? And it was just a, a massive jumble of briars and the odd headstones sticking out through the top of them.
the cemetery had suffered for lack of income and too much expenditure. Uh, it had fallen into quite bad dilapidation and disrepair. I picked up a publication in a flea market and it was a 1906 catalogue of the cemetery interleafed with all of the rules, regulations, prices and services were photographs of the Victorian Garden Cemetery. Really pristine environment. I said, that is the right place I have to come back to. We sketched together a proposal for the restoration of Glasnevin. When we started off, I felt like walking back out the gate. Because <laughs> uh, this is, you know, I couldn't foresee the scope of works that they wanted done to be done in the period of time they were talking about. The, the whole cemetery was in total decay from the fact that headstones were on the ground, headstones were falling over, they were covered in ivy. You couldn't walk around the place for fear of one of them falling on top of you. You couldn't see through the, the, the foliage with the trees because all the growth was all hanging down on the headstones. You couldn't walk around the roads because they were just shale and too. You, you'd break your ankle. It was just in a total dilapidated state. You know, at the time I said, this, this is just too much of a, a challenge. I like challenges, so I took it on. Do you try and bring it back or do you close the gates? Well, you couldn't close the gates. It's a historic site. I mean, people do call it the National Cemetery, even though it hasn't got the title, but they do call it that. We have a huge amount of famous people buried here. The seed was sown to restore the place. There's another one here, look. So we went to government for funding. We were promised 25 million over 10 years, so it was two and a half million a year. But that was in the good times. And sadly, as the recession bit and got worse, the funding was pulled. And now we're down to 250,000 a year. And you're straightening up the bill. It took them 10 years to build the tower. I was up there a couple of years ago, and it's a panoramic view across the city. But in 1971, a group of loyalists put a bomb in the base of the tower, and they destroyed the staircase. But only yesterday, we got approval to rebuild the staircase. So maybe the next time you come back to Ireland, I'll be able to bring you up to the top. It's quite a climb now, I'll tell you that. And we sell graves halfway up. Ah, uh, no, 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 we don't. Um, but come on down out of the The price of maintenance had overtaken any kind of revenue that was coming in through burial or cremation. And that's why they looked for a, a new stream to come in here and history and heritage and culture was a way of bringing fresh revenue into the place. I spoke to our architects, said, okay, we'll put a flower shop in there, we'll put a monument works in, and someone said, we'll put a museum in there. And we said, yeah, it's a great idea. So <laughs> hence, we could, land, we could land it with a museum. Hello, Glass, I'm Cemetery Museum, and they're speaking, how can I help? <laughs> yeah, we they're daily, uh, twice a day, half eleven and half two, and that's every day of the week. Uh, there's 1.5 million people buried in Glasnevin, so there's actually more people buried in the ground than walking around Dublin right now, just to put it into terms for you. Yeah. Now what we can do as well um, for, for that is, for tenure, we could arrange girls, for the tour and, and like admission to the museum, itself, but also say tea, coffee and a scone before or after if you wanted to do it that way as well. We thought build it and they'll come. Not at all. It's a completely different world. But we're getting there. All of the uh, social media sites, we are recommended as either one, two or three sites in Ireland to come to. And that's with the Guinness Hop Store or Kilmainham Jail or the Rock of Cashel. Or, uh, we could never imagine that that would happen here. Andrew, you wash your hands today. Yes, Shane, please. Andrew, can you do it 
When we first went to design the museum, we thought that the cemetery would be our artifacts and the headstones and graves, and we didn't need artifacts in here. We've learned from the general public that they like to actually see things belonging to these famous people. I have a couple from Markovich to my granny, congratulating her on getting married and congratulating her on the birth of my dad. Markovich signs IRA after her name, yeah. We put out in the media an advertisement that if people had artifacts from 1916 War of Independence to come in, show them to us, we got an amazing response to it. Well, we don't know a whole lot of the history of it. I mean, most of it's the story of my grandmother hiding it under our skirts, which is why the bud is cut off. Ah, and then, literally, it came to my dad and to us, but they didn't talk about it. So we really don't know who used it in the family or was it ever used? Yeah. <laughs> I assume it was. Having something belonging to Roger Caseman would be wonderful to have. It, it, it's great that it survived so much intact. Yeah, well, it was in better condition when I got it, actually. There's, um, uh, I think, one of the kids built um, cup of tea over it so there are a few small tea stains. It's a remarkable thing and totally unique as well like nobody else is going to have a, a, a casement bible signed in 1915. It's a very strange piece of Irish history to think that that was actually worn by someone running through the, the smoke and the rubble and the ruins and saw all the devastation in the centre of the city and you can tell by the rips and tears in it that he obviously was doing his job and he was working hard <laughs> over the week. Without a doubt, when it's out in the museum, you'll have people coming along going, oh, Denny Fitzpatrick, I know something about him. And, See, it, it but you can also also and have relatives case. coming you out of the woodwork the saying, oh, you own that. <laughs> Lots of those volunteers subsequently ended up buried in the cemetery, and that's why we're doing an exhibition about them, because they're out there and we want to tell their story. Florist business, we started that, and it was anything to make a pound. Um, I interviewed a whole range of people for a florist job, and um, I, little did I know that the lady I picked for the florist would become the wife. But I remember meeting her mother, and she said, yeah, she said, you pick the best flower in the bunch for yourself. <laughs> Good afternoon, best and florist. We do indeed deliver flowers, yeah. That's no problem for delivery today, is it? Yeah, it would be very busy normally, yeah. Um, we would have a lot of orders through into Flora, plus people coming into the cemetery. Um, now, normally it would be single roses or whatever the people put on the graves, just a little token. Um, but yeah, but normally we'd have a lot of into Flora orders, but I think today now is people have decided not to come out, it's a bit wet for them. I better tie it tight in this windy day. Do you have that balloon for Michael Collins? These are for George, are they for you? Yeah, Michael fun. Collins Luke quite, Kelly. quite a lot. Uh, Luke, Luke Kelly, Kelly they the would one. be very uh, fond Michael of him Collins. now, yeah. Um, um, De Valera a bit, but very little. definitely not as much as Michael Collins. So. Well, Michael is always very popular, he would get he gets balloons, okay. flowers, yeah, yeah. cards, lots, lots okay. of stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, we would have people ringing us from, well, we had one particular lady for a long time, she's ringing us from America, from flowers on the grave. Um, the other lady from Paris. And the other lady from Paris, nice, and there was yeah. a third girl, there was a young girl, do you remember the young girl? The young girl, came? yeah, she came on a regular basis. Yeah. If she came here on a holiday for a week, she would be here seven days a week putting uh, flowers, roses, roses, roses every on single the... day. Every day she would buy roses and put them on the grave. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. And she was younger then. She was in love with Michael Collins. She said she would never marry because there was nobody to his standard. No man had come up to his standard. So, so yeah. yeah. I think they all thought that he was They're so handsome in the movie that, that, yeah. <laughs> they fell in, they did, they, they fell did. in love with him love from the that. movie. A lot of uh, foreign people fell in love with him from the movie. Like, the whole image of him, like, obviously they never met him, so... Yeah. Yeah, will you go down and put it on? Yeah. Gorgeous day it is. OK, so get around, get around, children. <laughs> so this is the most popular grave in the cemetery, without any parallel. This is the one that gets flowers, letters. Uh, there's even a mysterious French lady that visits here. 
What day is today? Valentine's Day. And this is the final resting place of Michael Collins. And he gets Valentine cards every day, every year. You see fresh flowers. And yes, there is. Uh, happy Valentine's Day, Veronique. Right? So he gets stuff like that and balloons and all sorts of things like that. He fought a great war of independence, but then he was shot during the Irish Civil War. He was shot because after the War of Independence, there was two sides that had been friends before, but now were enemies over whether the six counties in the north would be part of Ireland or England or how we'd be as a country. Okay, boys and girls. Inside? Let's go. Yeah. What is it about Michael Collins? Well, it's the myth. It's the myth, you know. Collins was no better or worse than any of them. Um, it's just the myth has built up around him. He was charismatic. He was a good-looking guy. His actions in the Civil War divided the country. But since his death, and, and it was an untimely death, he was 31 years of age, so what he had squashed into those 31 years was quite remarkable. What he could have done later, nobody knows, but that's part of the myth. And when Hollywood makes a good movie about you, you know, who can fight that? I consider it to be a bit funny. Just so happened that one day a journalist asked me a question and, and I suddenly became the mysterious French lady. Basically, like, I suppose, thousands of people, I discovered Michael through the movie. The feeling was um, that there were good actors, but for Michael, there was someone behind the actor who was pulling the strings. And that was it. So that's the reason why I said, OK, that was a good movie, but there's something else, and I must discover what's behind, or rather, who is behind. I felt the need to go to Ireland, to go to visit Michael's grave, and that perhaps I would then know why. Perhaps wouldn't be able to put words on that why. But something would happen. And definitely something happened, because I've been coming over to Ireland sometimes up to six or seven times a year, since 2001. Katie Kiernan, she was due to marry Michael Collins in a double wedding, but that never happened. Had no family connections, no professional reason to have anything to do with Ireland. Yeah, I'm a specialist of Asian art. I have no connection at all with, with Ireland. That's what's made the whole thing a bit strange for me. Please bury me as close as possible to Michael. I come on my own most of the times, but I have taken a number of friends as well. And the one who is with me is a Vietnamese friend whose name is Phong. Being raised in Vietnam, she has a, a different view of life and death than most Western people. Avec Véronique, on parle souvent de Mick, de l'histoire, et puis ben, on leur amène toute cette partie d'histoire d'Irlande dans le présent. THR. It's like coming to visit friends. Okay, now we are going to visit the other friends, so we go to see Arthur Griffiths and we go to see Harry Bolland. Tu vois, c'est son c'est le fils? Euh, non, c'était son frère. Autant Harry adorait Michael, le, le frère. Dès qu'il a connu uh -huh. Michael, il... Oh, il, vraiment, il euh, l'aimait pas. C'est mignon, hein? Pour moi, le mort n'est pas mort. Le mort, c'est juste un mot, M-O-R-T. Ils ne sont morts que le jour où moi, je les oublie. La vie ou la mort, pour moi, c'est pareil. La personne a juste enlevé son enveloppe euh, corporelle, changé et allé ailleurs. Quand elle est morte, il a fait des pieds et des mains pour Donc avoir un, un, un lieu le plus près possible de Mick. Donc c'est ah. quand même pas loin. Hein. Mais c'est bien, c'est qu'elle a continué à vivre quand même. Elle ne va pas se montrer oui. dans l'adoration stérile de, de Mick. Bye bye Kitty. C'est 
see you next year. I think that when someone dies a violent death at such a young age, definitely something happens. Now again, there are people who would probably don't agree with me and uh, say that is not, not not rational. Love you. Perhaps, but there are other people I know who would totally agree and say, there's something that remains, we don't know where, we don't know how, but something still has to be made and the energy has to, to continue. Glasnevin Cemetery has many roles. It's there, uh, you know, as a, a cultural place, a historical place, uh, and as a personal place as well, because, you know, people come here to look after their mother's graves or their father's graves, so there's, there's a personal element to it uh, uh, as well. She's buried here four years in September. So we come up here nearly every Saturday, Sunday, just to come up and see her. Still very close to my mum, even though she is buried here. Um, I love coming up, especially when it's sunny, when it's raining, it's not too good. Occasions, like, Today, like Valentine's Day, is a big thing in our family. She always has to have her bunch of flowers on the occasion, whether it's Valentine's Day or Mother's Day. So it is very important that we always go up on the day. Just, she was so young when she died, so that we just like to feel as close to her as we can. Um, I don't feel like, I feel as close to her here than I do as at home. And I like to be here and I make sure everything is perfect on the grave. I would feel a connection when I'm standing at the grave talking, especially with my son, because he likes to stand and help as well, because we have a little um, baby on the moon on the side of the grave, so he always stands there and he talks to her and tells her that um, that's him, and um, he put that there when he was a baby, so he even feels a connection, even though he's never met her before. That's, it's, it is big, like, he even feels it. Mm. When I see somebody down the cemetery tending their mother's grave, to me it's like they're combing her hair or they're brushing her coat. It's an act of love, it's an act of devotion. You know, it's, it's them caring and it's their way of showing that they still care and still remember the person. And then you see people coming in to specific graves of Luke Kelly or Brendan Bean or Markovich because the person has a reverence towards that person and here's where they show that reverence. For me, the most important part of the whole cemetery is the tourists. Um, people can come up here and there's a beautiful museum and there's a nice cafe, but if you don't go out and walk around the cemetery and get some sense of the history out there, you kind of miss the whole point of it. My father was, was a tour guide and, and gave tours of this place back in the 50s. My father said to me, to give a good tour, that you need to do a couple of things. You need to tell people uh, 
something that they already know, because people don't like to be told everything. Something that they don't know, something that will make them laugh, and something that will make them cry. And if you can do that in an hour and a half in a tour, you'll have to deliver a pretty good tour. Um, OK, so the walls and towers, they surround a whole 120 acres of the cemetery. And they were built in the 1830s because when the cemetery first opened for the first 10 years or so, I had a huge problem with grave robbers. So they climbed over the wall of the cemetery and they walked up the path. It was very dark at the time. And they found Mrs. Jessup's grave and they said, there's his, and they got the shovels out. And they started digging, and they started scraping away the soil. And as they scraped it away, eventually they hit the coffin. And they got a crowbar out, and they wrenched open the coffin. And inside there was Mrs. Jessup, with a big ring on her finger. And Jem reined in, and he tried to, and he was pulling it, and pulling it, and it wouldn't come. So Jem pulled a knife out of his pocket, and he went, and cut her finger off, pulled it out, and took the ring and held it up. And it was moonlight, and you could see the diamond in the light. And the finger was on the ground, he says, we have it, Jem, we have it, it's worth a fortune, and we're going to Patagonia. And he put it in his waistcoat pocket, and he started walking on down the road. And as they were walking down the road, there was this old lady standing at a doorway, and she was waving at them. And she was going, hello, hello and she had long grey hair and a white dress. They noticed that she had no finger. And they were both looking at her and they were getting kind of nervous at this. And Jem says, do you mind me asking what happened to your finger? And the old lady said, yeah, yeah. And he said, who cut it off? And she said, this little thing here? You <laughs> did <laughs> I love this place, you know, I, 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 I love it. I, I, I walk through the back gate in the morning. Now, I'm not always in a good mood and I'm always mad into the last heaven, but I look at all the headstones and I imagine all the people here and all the stories that have yet, yet to be discovered and told, and, and it's a remarkable place. And it lifts my spirit to work here. Mason process takes roughly about an hour and a half and uh, it may take longer, it depends on the uh, size of the person. Obviously a lot of people nowadays are a little larger than they used to be. Uh, it can take maybe an hour and a half, it could take two hours. We walk around around about four or five a day. Down. 
I started in class Nevin about 35 years ago, seven, 1978 actually, and uh, came in here first as a grave digger. And in 1982 or so, a uh, job went on the board, as he used to say, and we all put our names forward, and I was the lucky one to get the job at the time. I was the first person to be trained in the Republic of Ireland as a crematorium technician. People were Jewish about it in the beginning. were sort of fearful of that, like it was against their religion, then they probably wouldn't go to heaven, or it was a sort of a, a sort of a pagan thing to get done to them. You know, the way I cremate the body, like you know, and what happens to you on the last day? But the body's supposed to rise on the last day. How could the body rise on the last time you're cremated? Well, you could ask the same questions when you're buried in the ground. It just speeds up the process. Take an hour and a half to cremate remains. What it takes to do in an hour and a half in the machine there, it would take months, maybe years to do on the ground. We'll head up to the church here for the actual services. Some people arrive and they could have music. They could actually arrive with a, with a band. We could tell people just arrived, just landed with, with a band. No advance warning. In the middle of maybe five or six other cremation services. And again, they're confined to maybe 20 minutes to a half an hour service. And it's trying to fit them in and try to let them, let them have the service that they want. It's the problem, because people don't, obviously don't realise that they're not the only cremation of the day. This is one of the popular pieces of music. You'll recognise it when you hear it, I'm sure. It's a nice soft piece of music that we sometimes play as the families are coming into the crematorium chapel here. The older generation, we still get people coming in asking for it somewhere over the rainbow, Judy Garland and My Way is another popular one. The time we were going to a phase here of time to say goodbye, it was, you were hearing it. So many times in the one day, like, you know, you're getting browned out, isn't it? <laughs> but, well, you know. There you go. Seen a lot over the years. A lot of sadness. Um, in some cases, there was a lot of happy occasions. People are happy at their person's passing, their release, they're in a lot of pain over the years or something like that. And it can be very sad as well. A lot of young people on tragic cases. And, uh, some people say, like, how do you do the job? But I myself, over the years, you kind of block it out in a sense. You come in, do what you have to do, and you go home and forget what's happened during the day. You try to forget what happened during the day. It's actually hardened me towards death, really. in all ages, right from babies to people that are maybe in their hundred years of age, like, you know, right up, right across the board, all religions, doesn't matter who you are, what you are, debt, it's got to come to us all, no matter what. Life after death? My belief, no. You're reduced to ash, dust. People say it's the soul that goes to heaven and all that. Whatever you want to believe, I don't think there's anything after it. We're like a flower. We come up, we flourish, and we die off. Another seed is sowed for another new plant to come up. That's the end of story. They think that they have pacified Ireland. They think they have purchased half of us and intimidated the other half. They think they have foreseen everything, think that they have provided against everything. But the fools, the fools, the fools, 
They have left us our Fenian dead. And while Ireland holds these graves, Ireland unfree shall never be at peace. Lots of people see Glasnevin as being a Republican Valhalla and, and all the heroes of revolutionary Ireland are buried up here. And they are, and it very much is. But it's not just that. And to just tell that story is to do not only Glasnevin, but Irish history a disservice. These two walls here are for World War I and World War II. 200,000 Irishmen took part in World War I. And they're Irishmen who fought in the British forces. 50,000 of them never came home, died. And at the same time that was happening, you had a rebellion in 1916 against the British. So Ireland has a very kind of uh, a divided, you know, like it's not quite as simple as uh, we all hated the British and we wanted to get rid of them. It wasn't that easy, you know. We have an Armistice Day commemoration here every year. And it's another layer of Irish history. You'll have a fella that died because of the Somme, buried alongside a volunteer for the 1916 Rising, that they could have been best friends. Both of them, working class guys, end up in unmarked graves in Glasnevin Cemetery. Commemoration has the potential to enable us to really learn about the world our ancestors lived and died in and to gain a, a deeper, more complex understanding of where we've come from as a people. You're looking at just outside the window, Michael Collins, with all the flowers on it. Um, and where's his friend de Valera? De Valera is ah. two paths away oh, I see. in the Republican plot. Uh, I just the hope they're not still battling in Arjun, heaven or in hell. <laughs> <laughs> we must remember its history, not living past. May this gathering, together with Remembrance Day thoughts and prayers everywhere, help move our world one step closer to the peace of your kingdom. Nevin has become recognized as a, a neutral, non-religious, non-political statement of, of what Ireland is. If there's one place in the cemetery that gets me, it's the angel's plot, because that's where they buried stillborns, miscarriages, uh, children to the age of seven. You know, the Daniel O'Connells of this world had a good innings and got a nice big monument and lived a full life, and, you know, they're easy to do. But when you see stuff like, you know, died before she had a chance to smile, you know, it, 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 it's a pretty emotive place, and it's a sad place. You know, you'd never bring a tour or anything like that up there because you just don't want to intrude on, 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 on that level of grief. Children who are stillborn or miscarried, they couldn't be buried in consecrated ground where it had been blessed by the church. Children were often buried in, you know, gardens and uh, fields and, you know, hedges and, you know, ditches. That's where the babies were, were buried. Daniel O'Connell's philosophy about Glass and Evan was that it was a place where people of all religions and no religion could be buried and buried with dignity. So this was the ideal place then for miscarried and stillborn children. Women did not attend the funerals. It was the man who brought the little baby here at Glasnevin Cemetery. They would hand the little box or the little coffin in down at the office and towards evening time, 
when the cemetery was closing. An official would bring the little boxes up and place them in, in the grave. It was extremely hard on the mother. You didn't necessarily see the child. So, like, I had that experience myself. I had a stillborn child uh, who's buried in the plot of the Holy Angels further up the cemetery. And uh, she was full term, term and a week overdue uh, when she died. And uh, at the time, uh, I was asked, would you like to, uh, the hospital to bury the baby or would you like to bury the baby the family, would they like to bury the baby themselves? Uh, so I decided my husband would bury the baby. So the baby, I never saw the baby, but uh, the baby, what he collected, uh, the, uh, he collected the baby on a morning or two after she was born and uh, brought her the little coffin in his car here to Glasnevin Cemetery. He was met by a grave digger and he brought him to what I know today is the plot of the holy angels. I did ask him to count the number of steps from maybe a headstone or maybe a tree or something like that, so that when I would get out of hospital that I would be able to find the grave. So he counted 64 steps. And of course, the first thing when I was able, I was out of hospital about a fortnight later, was come down here, count the 64 steps and uh, put down a little marker. What I didn't realise until I came to work here was that I didn't have to worry in that way. Glass and Evans Cemetery have a wonderful system of marking graves. They would have been able to tell me exactly where she was buried. So for me, it was wonderful to actually discover that I could actually get a print out and to look at it and to know, yeah, she did really exist. Yes, she was there. You know, it did happen. That record is my little piece of reality. Still often wonder, looking at it sort of, you know, wondering, there is part of me buried here and I, I never saw you. I don't know what you looked like. Uh, yeah, it's a mystery. It's a, something though that as you go on in life, you know, you do learn to deal with it and to cope with it. And um, you sort of feel, you know, she's there somewhere. Yeah. Sometimes here when you see people grieving and you hear what they say or, or, or you see them at headstones and whatnot, it kind of makes you appreciate life a little more. It makes you, it focuses you to appreciate life a little more. father was diagnosed with cancer and uh, he wasn't given, given very long and he went home and, and I, we kind of watched him and, and
I, I came in here and I went to George and I said I want to get a nice plot for my dad in the cemetery. And dad's father's buried up there. My grandparents are buried way down the end of the cemetery. And dad had originally planned to go in there. And I picked the plot over by Frank Ryan. And dad was a big fan of Frank Ryan and both of them had been editors and on full blocked and, you know, they had shared, they, you know, would have been, maybe not contemporaries, but they would have been of the same political ilk. And I, I took a photograph of, of, of the plot and, and I went to him and I said, do you want to be buried there? And he said, yeah, I'd love to be buried there. And then when he died, it was strange to come up here because this was where I gave tours and this was where I, 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 I you know, performed and made people laugh and made a bit lives and jokey and whatnot. And, and lots of people came to the funeral. It was a big funeral up in Ballymun. And we got here and we did the procession inside and, and all of the staff had come down to stand. And I couldn't believe that they'd came out and done that. And we brought Dad over to the grave and the piper played and he, and he was lowered into the ground. And, and that was it. And that was a Wednesday. And I did the tour I have too. times do you reckon we've been here now? Oh, it says five, six, seven times. It must be the seventh at least. Yeah. I come here twice a year for Luke Kelly's birthday and for his anniversary. I like to pay my respects to him, you know. My grandmother, my father's mother used to have an old record player and we used to have records of the Dubliners and that would have been the first time I reckon that I heard his voice. I feel like I know Luke Kelly, even though I never met him. I feel like I know him through the tunes and the songs that he sang. I feel like I know him through his music, so it's kind of, uh, it's um, kind of personal, do you know? It's such a unique sound. Nobody... Nobody can match him when it comes to singing. Yeah. He's just so unique, and he sang things with great passion. Will you be able to see me from there now? Yes. Yeah? Well, you want me to take some pictures and to say hello? Yes. And I'll leave you do your little piece yourself. I must away now. I can no longer tarry This morning's tempest I have to cross I must be guided Without a stumble Into the arms I love the most I must away now I can no longer tarry This morning's tempest I have to cross, I must be guided without a stumble into the arms I love the most, into the arms I love the most. Luke Kelly died on the 30th of January, 1984. A legend passed away that day and um, he'll be greatly missed. <laughs> Fellow Kellyites, I salute you. I probably wouldn't be a singer today if it wasn't for Luke Kelly. So uh, it's a great honor to be here, to be asked to be here. This song has 530 words. 
sung very quickly one after the other. <laughs> so you may need mouth to mouth after the song. <laughs> and this is for our wonderful president. You are the business, Mr. Higgins. <laughs> Luke Kelly forever. Was in the merry mood, the gentleman was from home. He started left the gear, the gentleman nearly broke and had a salute to Father J. This me bad, the mother I drank a pint of beer. Reap on days, his mother did not the reap the car. Labor I was born, but a stout black heart of vanished ghost. My brother, we found a pair of logs that go down the porch, right to the other thoughts of the rocky road. The top of the wood, the tree, my boy, and the head, and the down the rocky road, and other way, the double and mag for Lalita. A mixture of joy and sadness, I suppose. Sadness in the fact that he's no longer with us and that he left us at such a young age, only 43 and uh, joy in, in the, the celebration of the fact that we were all part of this wonderful family called the Dubliners and that Luke was such an important member of that family. Luke was often described as the soul of the group. And all the ways to Dublin back We're in the right place for talking about life and death and the line, the line in between and I, I think it makes us all very conscious that we're uh, mortal beings and we're not, going to, we're not going to live here forever. I think we all have to have some sort of a hope that there's something beyond this mortal life of ours here, you know, otherwise it would be all a bit pointless, I think, if we went through all the joys and sorrows of life and there was nothing more at the end of it. I don't have a romantic idea that we'll all be together with guitars and banjos and singing up in the clouds somewhere. We'll be aware spiritually of each other's presence, I think. I do believe that there's an afterlife. And I am very religious. I would believe that we do meet our, meet our loved ones when, when, when we pass on. I just believe that there's something there. I do envisage myself meeting Luke Kelly in the afterlife. I do. What kind of a mark does a musician leave? There's such a rich legacy of, of material. In a sense, they're not fully gone from us. They're, the spirit is still there, you know. Still very much alive in, in, in that sense, in, in one's mind, you know. The plowman leaves his trace on field and furrow. The sculptor's mark is etched in chiseled stone. With sheaves of gold, the thatcher's name is written in rings of clay. The potter's name is known. When day is done and evening firelight beckons, when tradesmen all are free from toil and care, I linger in the shadows with my fiddle and softly leave my signature in air. I would like to think that uh, there is something after death. Not heaven, not, you know, the great majestical, but maybe just returning to the, oh, I'm gonna sound like an old hippie here, um, returning to a couple of times in my life, I felt completely connected to everything, just on the grid, 
maybe about four or five times in my life when I was just in the moment, on the grid, felt connected to everything across the, the world. And I would like to think that when you die, you, you return to that grid. That's what I would like to think happens, but I don't know. Are you okay, sir? Okay. Come on, we've been to the Republican plot. It's getting cold, isn't it? Yeah, well, you've brought me out here. I didn't vote this. <laughs> yeah, hi, Jim. Uh, I just want to have a, a quick word with you about Friday. What is it? Uh, five adults, uh, two angels plot, and a child. And what's that? that is that the FD? Yeah. In Glass Nevin, there's tradition, or it's, it's the way that the cemetery is laid out. All people buried here are buried facing the rising sun, so they face east. All our graves are eight foot by two foot, head to toe, shoulder to shoulder. And when I say that, I mean head to toe, shoulder to shoulder. Coffins touch at times. It's that close. It's really, really, really tight. There's three in the, in the next grave. That won't, okay. that won't bother you. So um, we're going six foot six? Yeah. Just just keep an eye on the, on the banks with the, with the wet weather. All right. OK, no problem. Best, best yeah. you can. Keep them neat and tidy. And that's for 11.20 tomorrow? Yeah. Right. Yeah. OK. OK. There's nothing else. The one thing with burials is it's the last opportunity that any family has to do something for their loved one. OK, great, lads. Thanks. Put out of it. That's everything. Here in Glasnevin, it's very, very difficult. Every grave we open is different. The circumstances are different, the depths are different, the graves adjacent are different. And one of our golden rules here is never to disturb the dead. We will go to our utmost never, ever. And to, to such an extent that we have dug graves and we will get an encroach, what we call an encroachment. So it could be that the coffin's put in in this grave and after whatever 50 years, soil movement and whatever happens under the ground, there could be a two or three inch movement of the coffin and we go to dig the grave that we want to bury in and find, oh, there's a shoulder of a coffin sticking in and we can't get by. We won't go by it. We have to, sadly, we have to say to the family, sorry, we have an encroachment, we can't get full depth. But we won't disturb the dead. So we have a whole load of difficulties or things that we have to watch out for here in Glasnevin. It's all down to the ground. You could be lucky, you could get a nice dry one and it could take you two hours and you can get one that could be sticky and full of water that could take a day because you'd be pumping out water and you'd be doing this and you'd be doing that and as well as that you have to stop if you're digging a grave you have to stop and do burials as well and then get back to it if you're left by yourself you get a grave done quick enough you take over well one, one thing is we joke about it a lot and that's kind of a mechanism for us to deal with it. I was working for a few months back home in Germany in a hospital for old people dying slowly and that was way worse to be honest than doing this. For us it's really only a box to drop what we call it and uh, you are not in personal contact with the person you bury really. I'd rather get buried here. And, uh, yeah, it's like a get buried where somebody can come up and see me and talk to the grave and stuff like that. I'm mad things like that. <laughs> that's it, more or less. And, uh, I don't know, Val, go over yourself. Um, that's entirely up to my relatives. Oh, is it? Yeah. No, I, they want uh, I don't want to be a big burden for them, so... I'll get you, yeah. They can choose the cheapest option, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll take another look. There's a certain graveyard humour. There's a certain detachment that you will see in the offices. I remember the first time I heard date of death. You know, what's the date of death? And, and I've been so used to your date of birth, but date of death, it was a completely new phrase. And, and there's a certain detachment to all of that stuff. But then you see a load of majorettes coming to bury a little girl and they're marching along in their little majorette outfits. And you'd want to have a heart of stone not to be touched by that.
I'm cremation, definitely. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I have a little bit of uh, knowledge overload. Um, I am claustrophobic. I have freely admit it. Um, I cannot stand the thought of being put into a, a coffin, first of all, but I know I'm going to end up in one. But I'll be dead. I won't know, hopefully I won't know about it. Um, no, I like the idea that uh, you know, I, I'll go for cremation, I'll be a couple of hours in, in a nice and warm and I'll be dry and I don't, I don't like going the thoughts and going down into the ground and being cold. It just doesn't, doesn't appeal to me. I'm going to be buried with my father. I, I don't like the idea of cremation. I like the idea of going back into the earth and, and, and that kind of organic nature of it all, that you decay and you become worms and then 10,000 years, somebody takes you as a lump of coal and throws you on the fire and it all just starts all over again. We never, ever get used to death, even in our business, because there are so many different circumstances in which death may occur. If it's a very old person, maybe, who's reached 100 years of age who passes away, it's a massive celebration of that person's life. But then you turn around and it's a child. It's a totally different, totally different story. It can be very difficult for us as well not to become emotionally involved. And these people are depending on us for the strength to see them through this very challenging time that has been cast upon them. Death is so final. Someone passes away and they're brought to us and we prepare them and dress them and we bring them to their loved ones and we hope that we've prepared them in such a way that, that, that their loved one can get a certain amount of consolation thinking they're just lying there sleeping. But it's the last time you're going to see them. Before we close the actual coffin, you put the sheets over someone and then put the lid on the coffin and you get the very, very final piece. And a lot of people are not able for it. And um, as a result, we tend to ask people to leave the room before we close the coffin. Because for some people, they just cannot take that part of it. And I think it's quite right too, it's too final. Remember things as they were. I don't think my job has changed my views on life and death and the afterlife. I think what's happening in the world around me has had more influence on me than anything else from that point of view. So this is the final stop. I remember reading a book once and it said, if you want to be a hero, you need to be five things. You need to be young, charismatic, good looking, intelligent, 
And dead, yeah, 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 yeah. I've got four gone, if you're wondering. I, I don't say which four. I will have to go there someday and uh, be at somebody, one of my loved one's funeral. And they will be at mine. I'm in the queue. You know, I'll end up here in Glass Nevin someday. And, uh, but that's life. You know, we have to do it. There's one up there and it said, uh, remember now as you walk by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you shall be. So prepare for death and follow me. We're just caretakers, you know? We're here for a blip. This place is 170 years old, and it's gonna be here for another 170 years as well. You know, if, if, if I can promote it or open it or get people up here to show people what's here and let them walk around and enjoy it and, uh, and get into it, then that's kind of my job done. Me being part of the story and narrative, in 40 years' time, there'll be some other guy sitting here going, yes, I'm the resident historian, so, you know. We're just caretakers. I see his blood upon the rose, and in the stars the glory of his eyes. His body gleams amid eternal snows, his tears fall from the skies. I see his face in every flower. The thunder and the singing of the birds are Buddha's voice, and carven by his power, rocks are his written words. All pathways by his feet are worn, his strong heart stirs the ever-beating sea. His crown of thorns is twined with every thorn. His cross is every tree.
when I think, yeah, someday I'm gonna be buried here, where better, you know? Where else would I go? I must away now I can no longer tarry This morning's tempest I have to cross I must be guided Without a stumble Into the arms I love the most Wake up, wake up, love It is thy own true lover Wake up, wake up And let me in For I am tired, love And oh, so weary And more than near Drenched to the skin And when the Pass and over, and when the small clouds began to grow, he's taken her hand and they kiss and parted. And he saddled and mounted and away did go.